When Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party take control of Germany in 1933, they inherit the 1936 Olympic hosting duties, which they decide will provide the perfect opportunity to present Aryan superiority to the world. After warming up to their hosting duties during the Winter Olympics in Garmisch-Partenkirchen, Germany prepares to have the world's eyes on them during the Summer Games in Berlin. Racial discrimination, rumors of boycotts, and blatant propaganda efforts cast a dark cloud over the Olympic movement in one of the most infamous sporting events of all time. Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the Games Odyssey, Odyssey open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. We both love the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and we love history. But most of all, we love Olympic and Paralympic history. From the epic and inspirational moments we all love, to the, well, the more bizarre and controversial moments, we're fascinated by it all. Which is why we are on a journey through all of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, from the ancient Olympics held at Olympia, all the way to now. If you didn't listen to the last episode about the Winter Games in Garmisch 1936, just like that episode, we're going to lead this one off with a parental warning that this episode and the next one will discuss Nazism, it'll discuss racial discrimination, it will discuss anti-Semitism, it will even have a mention of suicide in here. So... If any of those are triggers for you, or you have little ones in the car with you right now, or wherever you are, just something to be aware of before we get too deep into this discussion. So, on that note, Sarah, are you ready to talk about Berlin 1936? I think I'm as ready as we're going to be. <laughs> what yeah. about you? Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like I've been kind of mentally preparing for this episode for quite a while now, and there was even a part of me kind of procrastinating <laughs> on some of the research just because these are really difficult games and a difficult time to talk about. Um, so let's kind of lead things off with what did you already know about Berlin 1936? I'm, I'm guessing quite a bit. But let's just start there. Yeah, I mean, I, I know about a lot of the star athletes. Jesse Owens, I know we'll talk about him. Um, right. We've already talked about our favorite movies, and I have a special place in my heart for Louis Zamperini. Um, mm -hmm. And so big players. I love Betty Robinson, who I know you'll talk mm -hmm. about her. <laughs> um, yep. So I knew about a lot of the big athletes that became notable, and not just... Boys in the Boat? Yeah, the Boys in the Boat. Which will... Yeah, yeah, which we'll get and, to as well. <laughs> and not not just the Americans, but um, right. of course, there were so many international athletes there who became very notable for various reasons. Um, and then right. I also know that we have a lot of footage because of the film that was made. And we know that that yeah. was a propaganda <laughs> issue um, or, right. or that it was part of their propaganda. We know that Hitler was a big part of this. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I, I know a lot, but even then getting ready for this episode, there were still new things that I was learning. And I'm sure that we're not even going to touch on everything that there is to know about it. But it's so important to talk right. about, share these stories, <laughs> figure out how we got here. <laughs> um, what about you? Yeah, there was quite a bit I knew about these games for the same reasons you just listed off. And we've discussed before that even people who aren't necessarily Olympic or Paralympic fans know about these games because they do hold a really distinct place in 20th century history in the run up to World War II and how the Nazis positioned themselves in front of the world with these games to basically say, hey, we're really not so bad. Look at us. We're welcoming the whole world. Like, see, the way we do things is really great, you know? So so I feel like a lot of people, at least to some degree, know a little bit about 1936. Or as you mentioned, they, they know about Jesse Owens, probably, and learned about him in school. So 
yeah, same thing as you. There were a lot, there was a lot in here that I did already know, but then there were some really fun kind of golden nuggets that I found along the way that I didn't know about that kind of helped make the research process a little bit more enjoyable. There were some ugly things I found too, obviously, but, but there were some good things along the way. Um, but before we get into some highlights, we'll just kind of let everyone know, uh, again, not just the parental warning, but also that we're not going to cover everything in this episode. This is going to be a two-parter because there's just too much with these games that I didn't want to skip over a lot of things that I felt like were important to talk about. So this episode is really going to focus more on the backdrop of the games, kind of what was happening leading up to it. We are going to talk about the torch relay because it was the first one, but we're not going to get into the actual events and athletes until part two. So if you get to the end of this episode and you're like, Hey, you didn't talk about any of the events. That's because it was part of the plan. So on that note, uh, let's go ahead and get into the highlights for uh, kind of the big stuff that we'll be discussing here. Yeah. So some highlights of the 11th Olympiad, the Summer Olympic Games in Berlin, 1936. The games ran from August 1st to August 16th, 1936, and are sometimes referred to as the Nazi Olympics, but we don't like to call them that here on our show. Berlin, 1936, would see the advent of the torch relay, with the Olympic flame being carried over 3,000 kilometers from Olympia to Berlin in the days leading up to the games. These were the first Olympic Games broadcast on television, with 25 viewing locations set up around Berlin for residents to enjoy watching free of charge. Five nations made their Olympic debuts in Berlin, Afghanistan, Bermuda, Bolivia, Costa Rica, and Liechtenstein. More than 4 million tickets were sold for events at the Games. To put this into perspective, the population of Berlin in 1933 was 4.2 million people. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's that's a lot of tickets <laughs> yeah they i think they did okay on the sales <laughs> yeah yeah i think they did i and i think i don't know that i included this in the notes at all but i think they i don't really know that they actually made money at all off of these games but that also wasn't really their goal <laughs> but they did sell a lot of tickets so As you kind of already alluded to, there is a lot of footage for these games. So we will find as much as we possibly can to put in our YouTube playlist. So if you've never checked those out, every one of our episodes does have some kind of YouTube playlist to go alongside with it. And if you didn't get a chance to check out the one for Garmish, there's some really great uh, videos in there of like the Paris figure skating routine, uh, things like that. So we'll do the same thing here. Uh, We'll track down a lot of little highlight reels and and throw them in there. So, you, you know, one day when you're bored at work, you can... (laughs) <laughs> go watch some of those and feel like you are there. Uh, but before we get into the background of how these games ended up in Berlin, let's take a quick little break and then we'll be right back. You might recall that the city of Berlin had previously been chosen as host for the Olympics way back for 1916. But those games were canceled because of World War I. So, Sarah, I know back when we talked about that, we discussed some of the kind of weird foreshadowing yeah. <laughs> of that, like, stranger than fiction, you know, type mm-hmm. of stuff happening there. So then after World War II, or sorry, after World War I, Germany kind of had to take an Olympic timeout for a couple of games, uh, but they were welcomed back into the Olympics in 1928 for competition. And then by 1930, there were at least 14 cities interested in hosting the 1936 Summer Olympics. And we're going to see some familiar names in this list I'm about to read off. So here is who put in a bid. Barcelona, Spain. Alexandria, Egypt. Budapest, Hungary. Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dublin, Ireland. Helsinki, Finland. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Lausanne, Switzerland, Rome, Italy, and then Germany had a whopping four cities that were bidding. 
Cologne, Frankfurt, Nuremberg, and Berlin. Okay, so that's quite a list. <laughs> yeah, Germany was not messing around with trying to get this bid, which, I mean, we already knew that. <laughs> yeah, and I was interested to see Rio in that list, because I'm like, wow, it took them a long time from <laughs> their first bid <laughs> to finally get the games. <laughs> well, yeah, and in case anyone listening to this doesn't know this, and, you know, we'll, we'll get there when we get there, but that right. was the first time in 2016 that the Olympics were held in South America at all. Right. Um, yeah. so not just, not just in Brazil, but all of South America, which, right. Yeah. We know that there's a lot there. We'll unpack it in the future, but anyway. yeah, it took a minute, but, <laughs> but yeah, clearly Germany was very, very eager to get the games with four cities bidding. So in 1931, the IOC met in Barcelona and on the day of the bidding vote, only two cities were left in contention at that point. Barcelona and Berlin. I wonder if the people in Barcelona, since they were having the meeting there, were really trying to schmooze them up and be like, hey, since we're already here, guys. Anyway, that's just speculation. Apparently, they didn't do the best job. (laughs) Apparently not. So uh, the final decision was 43 to 16. So the Olympics were awarded to Berlin. In part, it's thought that this was kind of a welcome back to the world gesture. And given the German eagerness to host, plus the canceled 1916 games, I think the IOC felt like Berlin made the most sense. And then a bit of historic irony is that just 69 days after this vote was taken, the Spanish Civil War started. And Spain wouldn't even be represented at the 1936 Games as a result. So even if they had voted for Barcelona, they probably would have had to award it to Berlin anyway, (laughs) which is kind of interesting to think about. So yeah. But yeah, so then that gets us up to 1933, which is when Adolf Hitler and the Nazis rose to power in Germany. So with his election as chancellor, that meant that his government inherited the games and their hosting duties. Now, at first, Hitler wasn't really a huge fan of this. He kind of saw the Olympic hosting duties as a distraction from his big plans for, you know, world domination. Just had other priorities on his plate. But his lackeys, in particular Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels, convinced him that this would be an excellent opportunity to showcase the glory of the Third Reich on the world stage and to calm some of the growing fears people had about Hitler, which, needless to say, justified fears (laughs) in retrospect. So with a little bit of convincing, that did win over Hitler, and then he became quite excited about the possibilities, and his government spared no expense in making the games a lavish event. Again, I don't think their concern was trying to turn a profit at all. They really just wanted to put on a huge show and basically just show the world, hey, we're awesome. Yep, join us, we're great. But only join exactly. us if you're of a certain type, so. Right. But we'll get into yeah. it. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to jump ahead. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard not to. But the Winter Games in garmisch partenkirchen which we covered in our last episode, those were kind of a bit of a dress rehearsal. I know we kind of speculated on that, but I've, you know, since seen... There's some other people who seem to agree with with that out there. So I I was happy to see we weren't too off base there. And then just weeks after the Winter Games were over... Hitler sent 3,000 troops to the Rhineland, even though that was supposed to be a violation of the Treaty of Versailles. But, you know, people kind of ended up letting it slide at the time. Meanwhile, one of Hitler's hopes for the Berlin Games was that it would showcase Aryan athletic superiority, particularly in the popular track and field events. His hopes, of course, were famously dashed by one Jesse Owens, but more about that in the next episode. And then ultimately, Hitler's opinion of playing host to the Olympic Games, like I said, it did a full 180. And it's reported that he once said he wanted all Olympic Games hosted by Germany in the future, 
even going so far as to suggest Germany would build a stadium that could accommodate 400,000 spectators. So he went from being kind of annoyed by the idea to a huge fan of the idea of just doing it there forever, apparently. Now, one of the key organizers for the games was Hans von Schammer and Austin, that is quite a name, who was head of the Reich Sports Office. He promoted sport as a good way to create unity among German youth and strengthen the German spirit. On paper, that sounds awesome, but also he believed sport would be, quote, a way to weed out the weak, Jewish, and other undesirables. That is, again, a a direct quote from him. So, Von Schammer also had two trusted individuals for organizing the main details of the games. Theodore Lewald, who was also a German member of the IOC, and he was named as the president of the organizing committee. And then Dr. Carl Diem, who would introduce the idea of the Olympic torch relay. And on that topic, I'm going to pass the baton, or torch rather, to you, Sarah. Thanks for that. So yeah, Dr. Carl Diem is credited for coming up with the idea of the torch relay. The cauldron had already been previously introduced. Uh, The torch was lit at the ancient site of Olympia and carried across seven countries, Greece, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Germany, a journey of over 3,000 kilometers. The actual lighting was really a kind of genius idea. Which we hate to admit, by the way. (laughs) I know. (laughs) It's like that meme that it's like someone who you don't like makes a good point. And it's like, dang it. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, on July 20th, 1936, 15 Greek maidens dressed in the traditional robes of ancient priestesses were assembled at the ancient site of Olympia, which this is very much like what we see even now. Um, yeah. whenever they light it. So if this sounds familiar, it's because this is a tradition we still see. Right. The actual lighting was done by using a reflector, which directed the rays of the sun at the kindling. So yeah, the flame was lit by sun power. It's pretty cool. <laughs> the maiden representing the high priestess lit the torch and then handed it to the first Olympic torch bearer, Kirill Kondilis, which I'm not going to lie. I would love to be the first official torch bearer. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I know. Like, (laughs) that's one of my biggest dreams in life is to be part of a torch relay. But when that happens, it'll happen. Anyway. Yeah. um, Someone (laughs) nominate Sarah. Because there's a whole nomination process. I know. You can nominate people for it. Yeah. I have to do something really great in society to get that (laughs) honor. So haven't figured it out yet. But if anyone wants a lot of cookies, I'll be happy to bake in exchange for getting around with the torch, (laughs) even for 50 kilometers, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Or, no, not 50, like 5. Let's be real. (laughs) 0.5. No, it's going to be one of those 0.5. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is one of those things where I'm like, yeah, no, I I can do a 5K. That's about it right now. Back to (laughs) Greece. From a propaganda perspective, the Nazis saw this as a symbol of being the heirs of Greek enlightenment. In fact, according to an article in The Guardian, Hitler had actually ordered his scientists to find an ancestral connection between his Aryans and the ancient Greeks. Dude, that's not how science works. <laughs> yeah. That is such a big reach. Yeah. Can you imagine being those scientists where it's like he shows up and is like, I, I just need you to make this work. Okay. Just whatever you need to do, make the genes line up. Mm-hmm. It's like, I, I yeah. Oh, 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 okay. Yes, sir. Like, It's so weird. (laughs) Yeah. Absolutely not. This was because he considered the modern Greeks' heritage to be polluted by Levantine influences. We had to look up what that means, and it refers to the Levant, a region much of the Middle East, including Syria, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, etc. I mean, it's no shocker to us in 2022 that... Hitler was racist and this is just you know one more evidence where he's kind of picking and choosing like I really want to have Greek heritage Uh but I also don't like the Greeks so 
I need to claim that they their bloodline was polluted somehow. Like it's just so mm-hmm. it's just such a twisted way of thinking about the world. Yeah. Ever heard of Lenny Rappenstahl, the German Olympic filmmaker? Yep. She was commissioned by the German Olympic Committee to film the games at a price tag of a staggering seven million dollars. Which, like, of course, you've heard of her because you're the film buff of the two of us. But, yeah. But I mean, and and I was familiar with her name just because of being familiar with the film. Yeah. But, but I mean, that's a lot of money back then. I didn't do. I mean, the, that's a lot of money now. That's a lot of money now. <laughs> but <laughs> I but take seven million. <laughs> that's fair. Um, but yeah, I don't know what that would be exactly in today's dollars, but it would be a lot. So, I mean, this was a massive production, which we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, a little bit later on, but yeah, she was well paid for her work. (laughs) She filmed the Olympic torch relay in addition to the games, but it should be noted. She didn't include footage of Kirill in the final film because he didn't exactly represent the Aryan ideal. Yeah. Obviously, there was some uh, editing there, going on. <laughs> quite a bit of editing, which, I mean, <laughs> which, to be no fair. Surprise. Yeah, you, you can't show the whole thing, but the fact that you intentionally leave off the very first person to carry the torch, uh, that's, that's sketch. <laughs> yeah. In fact, most of the torchbearers were Greek peasants, people with Slavic ancestry, and a group of overweight, middle-aged <laughs> dignitaries. <laughs> One of the torchbearers was Hungarian politician Prince Starenberg, who the article described as violently opposed to Hitler. So yeah, I'm glad the first torch relay didn't quite live up to Hitler's propaganda hopes. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is like a small consolation there. Small but, consolation, for sure. <laughs> yeah, like very tiny, but we'll take it. We'll take what we can get, which is so sad. But when the flame was finally brought into the Olympic Stadium for the opening ceremony, they were sure it was carried by someone who did represent the Aryan ideas. Slim, blonde university runner Fritz Schilgen, who literally was chosen for his appearance. From the looks of it, he didn't even compete on the team. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I, I thought it for like, surely he was on the team, but... No, no, like his his only listing anywhere is just as a torchbearer. So it's like, okay, they literally just picked him because he was blonde, blue eyed, and muscular. So <laughs> that's ridiculous. Yeah. Still, the torch relay and lighting of the cauldron made a made for a dramatic opening ceremony, and has been an Olympic tradition ever since. Which. It is one of my favorite parts of opening ceremony, or favorite parts of opening ceremony, if not the favorite part of mine. So, other than maybe the Parade of Nations. So, yeah. How do you feel about the fact that the Nazis came up with the torch relay? I mean, conflicted, obviously, because I also love the idea of the torch relay. And as you said, it is like that meme (laughs) of, oh, someone I don't like came up with a really great idea. So, you know, I think this is one of those moments when we kind of have to recognize that not everything that we like in life is always going to have a a good birthplace, you know, like, like history is riddled with mistakes and with people who had bad motivations. And and sometimes it's our job to redeem those things and appreciate Mm -hmm. them for the good that is in them. So Yeah, I love the tradition. I love how cool the idea of the lighting ceremony is and that it has become an important part of the tradition. Um, But it really stinks that the Nazis came up with it. It just does. I know. I know. And I I guess that's something that makes me happy. Um, and, And to be clear, not that I'm claiming that we have in the Olympic movement and as fans of the Olympic movement, not saying that we've achieved perfection on this stuff, but as the Olympics and Paralympics become more inclusive um, Mm -hmm. and more conscious of these things in our world, it does make me really happy that there's a lot of people who are not white, who have lit in the cult, who have lit the cauldron um, and and carried the torch in the relay. So um, it may have come from the Nazis, but I'm really happy that Hitler would probably be pissed off at the <laughs> platform a lot of these athletes have been given. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah. yeah. And again, that's not to say that it's perfect or figured out or that it makes up for any of the atrocities of Hitler, but hopefully what I said makes sense. Yeah. Well, and that's why I was glad to find out that there were people who participated in this first relay who did not match exactly what he wanted and and straight up like a political opponent of his was like, yeah, give me that torch, you know, (laughs) like let Hitler have to deal with the fact that I was one of the people who, Mm -hmm. (laughs) who who carried the the flame. So I'm, I'm happy about that parts of it that despite his, you know, efforts and the idea behind trying to make this link with being a superior race did not, exactly work out the way that they wanted so we're gonna kind of take a quick pause there take a little break and then when we come back we are going to talk about boycotts all right so one of the things i think a lot of people know about these games is that there was discussion of a boycott happening, especially here in America. So we're gonna get a little bit into those details and you know it definitely feels uh feels a little bit fresh because this is 2022 when we're recording this and of course we had more discussions of boycott in the lead up to the Beijing games this year so this should sound really really familiar for a lot of people so uh given the state of the world and the rise of Hitler to power there was a lot of news of the Nazis racist ideology that started to get out In particular, their treatment of Jewish Germans who were more and more being persecuted. This included having their businesses and their houses taken away from them, forced relocations to labor camps. Uh, You know, there's plenty of examples of Jewish Germans who were immigrating to the U.S. at this point as well because they saw the writing on the wall. So all of that is happening and news is getting out. Jewish Germans were largely banned from sports and Olympic competition in the run-up to the Games, including, most notably, Lily Hennock, a shot putter and discus thrower who is a four-time world record holder, and also high jumper Gretel Bergman, who was suspended just a mere days after she set a world record. So, I mean, again, it's just... Ridiculous, ridiculous. keeping this great talent <laughs> off the team because of their heritage. Mm-hmm. So anyway, mm-hmm. uh, so in solidarity, there were a number of Jewish athletes from other countries who did decide to boycott the Berlin Games, uh, such as hurdler Sid Keel of South Africa, French fencer Albert Wolf, and even American athletes Milton Green and Norma Connors. And so people started paying attention to this because of these high-level athletes saying, no, we're not going, and here's why we're not going. So the American Jewish Congress and the Jewish Labor Committee both supported a full American boycott of the Berlin Olympics, a move also supported by various members of the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, who also supported a full American boycott of the Games. Now, You know, obviously not everyone agreed about that move, which we're going to get to here in a second, but it it started to become a thing people were talking about. And obviously this would taint the reputation of the games for Germany and their own propaganda efforts. But there were many members of the USOC who didn't want to take away the Olympics from athletes, even if they weren't fans of the Nazis. Uh, There were also those who kind of assumed Hitler was probably more bark than bite, and since the U.S. was still largely isolationist in their international policies, the news from Germany about treatment of Jewish people and other minorities felt to many Americans like it didn't really have anything to do with them personally, so why really worry about it? So again, this debate is kind of a familiar one. Where do you draw the line in keeping politics out of the Olympics? Um, I don't have an easy answer for that, obviously. It's always going to be a difficult question. And, you know, one could even argue that Americans had already danced with that line because of their refusal to dip the flag to royalty in other host cities like London, Stockholm, and Amsterdam, which, you know, Sarah, we've we've talked about that, of course, so... You could say Americans have already been political, but then Mm -hmm. we're justifying why not to get political with with this situation. So, right. So, yeah, 
the big question people were grappling with was, would attending the Berlin Games be an endorsement of Nazi ideology? Some thought so. The American Olympic Association even suggested that the Games should be moved to Rome instead, which, as uh, we listed off earlier, Rome did have a bid in at one point. But of course, this is the American Olympic Association, not the IOC. They had no authority to actually make that happen. It was just talk more than anything else. One prominent individual who did support an American boycott was an IOC member from the U.S. named Ernest Lee Junkie. Now, we'll come back to Ernest in a bit, so remember his name. But first, we need to talk about another name that Olympic and Paralympic fans will probably recognize, Avery Brundage. Here we go. Yep, there's that name. (laughs) There's that name, yep. We kept saying we were going to talk about it more, and here we go. <laughs> here here we go. Yeah, so you might recall from a number of episodes back, he was a former Olympian himself, having competed in the first Olympic decathlon, a- along with Jim Thorpe back in Stockholm 1912. Uh, but of course, with much less success than Thorpe. Now, Avery had remained involved in athletics ever since the end of his own Olympic career, uh, rising in the ranks to become president of the U.S. Olympic Committee. He opposed the boycott, saying that politics shouldn't mix with sport, and particularly butting heads with AAU president Jeremiah T. Mahoney, who did support a boycott. And uh, Mahoney, you know, he kept saying that Racial discrimination was a a violation of the Olympic rules, and therefore attending the Berlin Games would be the same as supporting the Third Reich. So, with these two guys (laughs) butting heads over it, uh, the debate over the American boycott, I mean, it it was pretty heated. And who gets sent to go check things out in Germany? Avery Brundage, which... Okay, you think I, I think about this now, Sarah. I'm like, you got these two guys arguing with each other over uh-huh. this. Wouldn't it make more sense to s- send like, you know, an unbiased third party, not one of the guys who's <laughs> arguing for one side? It would it would make too much sense to do that. That's the it problem. Would, yeah, it would, it would make way too much sense to say, you know what? Let's let's send an impartial person over here, but. Yeah, because of his position, Brundage was sent over to Germany to inspect things for himself and to bring back a report. Again, probably not the best pick, seeing as we already know how he felt about it, and also given the fact that Brundage was a member of a private club in his hometown of Chicago that didn't allow Jewish members. Uh Uh-huh. So, Uh red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag, all the red flags... Um, and maybe this is going too far, but a red flag with a swastika on it. Let's just be real. Yeah, here. but I mean, <laughs> really, if you yeah. if you don't want to be accused of being an anti-Semitic yeah. person, maybe don't, don't be part of an club. anti-Semitic organization. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Yeah, getting a little worked up over here. So, no, which, um, but on a side note, and not to make yeah. this a movie discussion, but don't they show part of this in the movie Race? That's about they Jesse do. Owens? They do. Yeah, there is a whole scene in that movie of Brundage going over. And honestly, I think they're a little generous to his presentation in that movie, if I remember it. Like, they were, but but I will say that my knowledge of him was very minimal before watching that. And because I am me... Um, I did a lot of research on him after watching the film to where I was like, yeah. oh, oh, he was shady. Um, but yeah, that's just yeah. what's coming to my mind is like those closed door meetings that were going right. on. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I'm with you. It's not like they portrayed everything about it, him. It's a movie. It's a yeah. movie. Like yeah, they got to build up the drama. So but yeah, um, I just was like, I'm vis- I, like, I have this vision in my head of watching this. But anyway, right. Not to get into the movie. And, and again, we're going to talk about Jesse. He'll come back. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. So probably no huge shocker here. But Brundage's report of the Nazis was glowing. Hey, things look great over there. What racism? They're going to have a Jewish fencer on the team. I'm paraphrasing here a little, but you get the idea. Um, And speaking of that one Jewish fencer, you might recall 
our conversation a couple of episodes back about Helene Mayer, who was the gold medalist from the women's foil event in 1928. And so, yeah, to convince the Americans that they weren't truly prejudiced, Mayer was chosen by German officials as the quote unquote token Jew for the German team. So, um, you know, she's remained a controversial figure for this. And as a reminder, she did later say that part of the reason she competed in 1936 and even gave the Nazi salute was because members of her family were already in a German work camp at the time. Um, I want to believe her on that, you know, because I think she was in a really unfair position. It really does seem to me like she was being used as a political pawn. I don't know that we can judge her position because none of us can imagine what that would be like. But um, the Nazis discarded her once they were done with her. Um, and, you know, still, she won a silver <laughs> medal in the games, even with all that pressure on her shoulders. So we want to be careful with, with her legacy <laughs> there. Anyway, back to Brundage, unfortunately. So he comes back to the U.S. and says, Hey guys, everything's fine. Everything's good. And in a vote held in December of 1935, the boycott effort dies. It's done. Not going to happen. Then, as the Winter Games were happening in Garmish, as we talked about last episode, the IOC hastily called an impromptu meeting, and they promptly kicked out Ernest Lee Junkie from the IOC. And it was all over his support of the U.S. boycott effort at the end of the day. That's why they kicked him out. They did not want him around for voicing his opinion on that. Who did they decide to give his seat to? Avery Brundage. So this is kind of the the big mm -hmm. step then where, you know, Brundage does become IOC president later on. This is that kind of big step for him to, to get onto the IOC itself. So... It should also be noted here that Brundage was so won over by the Germans during his little inspection that he proposed that the American athletes should give the Nazi salute during the opening ceremony in honor of their hosts. So Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So now part of this was to probably avoid the same situation from the Winter Games. So this was something we didn't cover in the last episode because it made a little bit more sense to keep here in context. Um, so the Americans did not give the Nazi salute during the Winter Games in Garmisch. And Hitler was so angry about this that he actually went out of his way to go down to the U.S. locker room and yell at the hockey team and coach about it as if they were the ones to make any kind of decisions <laughs> on the matter. But My whatever. gosh. Which, but also, yeah. like, I can't remember. We didn't talk about this, did we? Um, that it is tradition, I think maybe we did. Okay. It's tradition in opening ceremony that when the United States comes out, we never dip our flag to the host right. country. Other countries right. do. Other yeah. countries do, but we never have. And that's, right. that's a longstanding tradition even before 1936. So yeah. sorry, sorry, Hitler. At least that's one tradition that you're not going to change. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Not even for um, Hitler, and especially for Hitler. Good grief. Especially for Hitler, yeah. God. So, um, and and we'll talk about it in a minute, but there is also something called the Olympic salute that will kind of clarify in a little bit, because sometimes people, when they look back at photos of 1936, they see athletes giving something that looks a lot like the Nazi salute, but not quite. But anyway, we'll get there. <laughs> so... Okay. All right, so getting back to the IOC, um, we need to talk real quick about IOC president Henri de Bayet Latour. So in our last episode about Garmisch, we shared about the conversation between him and Hitler over taking down the no Jews or dog signs. And turns out we yeah. were actually a little too generous towards Henri oh, <laughs> because... Right. I, yeah, you know, doing more research into Berlin, I started to find some dirt that wasn't associated with Garmisch. So we're going to get into that because um, he, he's maybe not such a great guy himself. OK, so in a letter he sent to Avery Brundage in 1933, he wrote, quote, I am not personally fond of Jews and of the Jewish influence, but I will not have them molested in no way whatsoever. 
So yeah, that's that's not great. No. Um yeah, so basically he's like, yeah, I don't like Jewish people either, but yeah, you know, I'm also not going to go out of my way to pick on them. Is <laughs> was basically what he was saying. Um also not so great is that after the 1936 Berlin Games, he would become an honorary member of the Nazi sports organization run by Joseph Goebbels. And in 1938, Henri's wife wrote to Hitler to congratulate him for his invasion and annexation of the Sudetenland. Oh, and by the way, then when Hitler invaded their home country, because they were originally from Belgium, uh, so when Hitler invaded Belgium in 1940, Henri's wife wrote Hitler again to thank him for, quote, bringing Nazi ideology to Belgium. She's really got to find a better pen pal here. <laughs> like, yeah. This is this is not great. So, yeah. so you know, kind of reflecting back on the Garmish situation, like I had to realize, okay, so he's not great either, but he didn't like the appearance of the signs. That's what this was really about. Mm -hmm. It was not so much because he was, um, you know, I mean, he was clearly anti-Semitic himself, like, right. finding this other stuff out. It's just, he didn't want the signs up. Like, hey, let's not have the IOC associated with that. But once, uh, you know, once Germany had impressed the world, he was totally fine, apparently, mm -hmm. to throw his hat mm -hmm. in with them. Anyway, that's kind of a little, I guess, correction to his legacy that needed to get out there. Um, back to boycotts, though. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'm sitting here thinking, like, he seemed a little bit better. <laughs> But the bar was really low. The bar was really low. <laughs> yeah, really low. So it should also be noted that Great Britain, France, Sweden, Czechoslovakia, and the Netherlands also considered boycotts for the Berlin Games, but not quite as seriously as the U.S. And honestly, they were probably following the U.S.'s lead here. So I think there's a good chance that had the U.S. actually boycotted, it would have probably been a little bit of a domino effect and we may have seen some of these other countries do the same thing and then technically spain boycotted the berlin games and decided to host their own people's olympiad in barcelona but the event had to be canceled as i kind of mentioned earlier when the spanish civil war broke out literally a day before that competition was set to start so there's that and then um, a little bright spot, because we need a bright spot about now after everything that we've just been discussing, but the first Turkish and Muslim women to compete in the Olympics uh, were here. So so here's a fun little fact. Yeah, that that's we get exciting. To, it is exciting. So, so we're going to talk about that for a second here as part of the boycott. So um, Halet Shambel and uh, Suat Fetgeri Ashani of Turkey, uh, they were actually offered by their guide to have a formal introduction to Hitler while they were at the games, and both of them refused, specifically citing his treatment of Jewish people. So, all the applause to them for, you know, yes, that's not a boycott, but they had an opportunity to meet Hitler and said, Absolutely not. <laughs> so good for them. Mm -hmm. Trailblazers and just good people from the sound yeah. of it. But so anyway, German influence was strong in the lead up to Berlin. In fact, in the Garmisch games that we covered in our last episode, many of the British athletes actually did give the Nazi salute as they passed by Hitler in the opening ceremony as a sign of respect to the host nation. Obviously, that's something they would all regret later on. Um, and it's also thought that because of the Nazis' anti-Semitic policies, that Jewish athletes from other nations were sidelined, either because of concerns for their safety or because nations were simply capitulating to Nazi policy. Again, can't always prove that, but it does seem like there was a odd shortage of Jewish athletes when compared to previous Olympics. Uh, there was also some discussion among Black Americans of a separate Black boycott of the Games over concerns of how Black athletes would be treated in Germany, especially considering the discrimination that they faced here in the U.S. Segregation, Jim Crow laws, lynchings, all of those awful, terrible things, right? 
which again yeah. i think is something they hint at in the movie race as well if i remember correctly yeah so and not to steal your thunder i think you may mention this mm-hmm. in the next episode but and so we can plug it twice but there's a great documentary olympic pride american prejudice yep um mm-hmm. and and yeah you can talk about it more again so not trying to steal your thunder but um nope, you're just, good. this is this is very relevant to that and Um, it's, it's a very well done documentary. I think it got a few awards, including from the NAACP, but you know, growing up in the United States, if, if you're listening to this and you're not from the U S we like, we hear all about Jesse Owens and rightfully so. I mean, the guy (laughs) did incredible things, won a lot of medals. We know this, but it was a great documentary diving into the rest of the black athletes, um, or at least the black track athletes that were there, um, or I'm sorry, athletics athletes who were there. Right. <laughs> and so I, I learned a lot from watching it. It's been a while since I've seen it. So maybe I want to go watch it again. But anyway, that's a, that's a plug for that documentary. Yeah. And that's actually one I haven't seen yet though. It's oh, list, it's good. So. <laughs> it's it's yeah. really good. Um, it's been probably three or four years since I watched it. So I, mm-hmm. maybe that's just going to be an annual thing for me, but yeah, it's, it's a great documentary. Learned a lot. Everyone should watch it. And I think it was on Peacock <laughs> when I watched it. I, yeah, I think that's where I've seen it pop up as well. But yeah, no, I no, it's fine to plug that here because we do mention it in the next episode, but sometimes people forget. So it's fine to, to mention it here. But um, ultimately, most Black-run newspapers and organizations at the time supported Black athletes going to the games because they knew that the potential victories by Black athletes like Jesse Owens uh, would do more good for their cause by undermining the Nazi philosophy of Aryan superiority. So, um, which is exactly what happened. So, you know, they had kind of a good point (laughs) that, look, if America's going to go, we might as well flex our muscles and show just how wrong this way of thinking Mm -hmm. is. But again, we'll, we'll kind of touch on that a little bit more in, in the next episode for sure. And now Sarah, the toughest of tough questions of all time Knowing what we know now, should the U.S. have boycotted the Berlin Games? Or has history shown that those kind of boycotts just don't really achieve much anyway? Gosh, that's such a hard question. (laughs) Um, I mean, it's easy to say knowing what we know now about what was coming to Nazi Germany and what would happen in the years after. It's easy to say, yes, absolutely, we should have boycotted and done more. Right. But then you look at other boycotts that have not meant much at all. Um, like 1980. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I'm certainly no expert on the 1980 situation. I mean, we know it was not great and all that. And I know it was the Cold War yeah. and Rush- the Soviet Union and all that. But, um, right. but I don't, I don't know how I can compare the two. Yeah. With like, cause I, there, there wasn't the Holocaust. There were certainly things that were not okay, right. but it, it wasn't the Holocaust that was coming. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's it's hard to say, um, you know, recently in 2022 with Beijing, we had a diplomatic boycott, which right. totally support because athletes still got a chance to compete. But yeah, that's a hard one. Like, that's hard. I, it is. I, I, you don't it, have it, to have an answer. I, know, there, I, I don't say, think there is a real answer I know, <laughs> to the question. I know. I, w- I was going to say that, like, yes, my, my quick answer would be, yes, of course we should have boycotted. But I also understand that that may not have done much anyway. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, World War II is still going to happen no matter what. Right. And, and I think we can look back retrospectively and say, yeah, like the war was coming. The U.S. not going would not have stopped the way that Germany treated Jewish people and other minorities that they persecuted. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I I lean towards the side of, yeah, you know, I think it is a good thing that we were there because we do see some of these great stories come out of how Hitler's plans did get a little bit undermined, you Mm -hmm. know, Right. But but it but it is tough because because my moral compass also says, yeah, but all these things were happening behind the scenes. And and do, did we kind of support that by being there? It, it, 
Again, it's hard. It's hard. I, there's not a real answer to this question, but I think we, I think what we can say is we can have some grace for the way that the vote was done and recognize that again, this was before the war had happened. Um, Hitler had only been in power for a couple of years. People didn't really know the whole picture of what was going on. So I think more than anything else, they didn't want to take the opportunity away from the athletes mm-hmm. is what it came down to. So right. anyway, it's really heavy to think about. <laughs> so let's take a little break <laughs> and then we're going to get into more heaviness with <laughs> the opening ceremony and the venues. There uh, we go. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But we'll uh, talk about that when we come back. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about venues and the opening ceremony. Mm -hmm. Hitler wanted to outdo the Los Angeles 1932 games by building a new 100,000-seat stadium in addition to six other new gymnasiums. In all, there were 22 venues used for the games. In preparation for the games, Berlin's chief of police was giving permission to arrest all people of Romani descent in an effort to, quote, clean up this city, moving them to a, end quote, special camp. Um, Not so so, great. And if you know anything about history, that special camp. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just it's not so special. Awful. Yeah. Um, It's estimated that in total, the German government spent $30 million in preparation for their hosting duties. During World War II, the Olympic Stadium itself would become an underground bunker as the tides began to turn against Germany during the war. Work on the Olympic Village began in 1934, overseen by Wolfgang Fussner, who was half Jewish. But when the Nuremberg Nuremberg laws were passed the following year, he was classified as Jewish and demoted, though the public reason given for his demotion was that he wasn't acting with, quote, the necessary energy For the project, because obviously the Nazis didn't want word to get out about having a half Jewish officer on the project. Um, (laughs) It's just, it's, it's all bad. It's just, it's going to keep getting bad. We know this. Yeah. Sadly, two days after the conclusion of the Berlin games, Firstner would, would decide to commit suicide when he realized he had no professional future under a Nazi controlled Germany. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure that, like, this is his story. We know that these kind of stories happen to lots of people. Yeah. During World War II, the Olympic Village was used as both a hospital and as an army infantry academy. When the Soviet Union took over the area in 1945, they converted it into a military camp. There have been some efforts to preserve the sites, most notably with the dorm used by Jesse Owens and other American athletes being restored. As we alluded to earlier, German filmmaker... Lenny Rippenstahl was given a lot of freedom in how many cameras and crew she could have in the venues, capturing unique angles and introducing new techniques in cinematography that were truly groundbreaking at the time. In fact, her film Olympia is still studied to this day. Yeah, I mean, it's considered a breakthrough film in so many ways, especially, you know, in terms of how we film sports. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like... So again, it's, this is one of those like complicated things of she created so many great innovations for the world of filmmaking with this movie, Mm -hmm. but it was for a really terrible reason (laughs) and motivation, but yeah, just a difficult legacy there. Yeah. Yeah. The motto of the games was, I call the youth of the world, a not so subtle proclamation that the Nazis wanted their ideology to spread far and wide. The opening ceremony took place on August 1st, and the infamous airship, the Hindenburg, flew over the stadium close to the start of the ceremony, flying the Olympic flag behind it. During the Parade of Nations, some athletes from a variety of nations gave the Nazi salute. Lots of others, especially the French, gave the Olympic salute, which had been a tradition since Paris 1924. Unfortunately, the Olympic salute bears a striking resemblance to the Nazi salute. So this was seen as a support for as support for fascism. And after World War II, the Olympic salute was dropped altogether, which yeah. for the best. Yeah. Well, and this is what I was saying earlier. Like if you look at some of these old 
photos and video footage, you'll sometimes see athletes giving a salute that looks kind of like the Nazi salute, but, but looking at it, you're like, well, they're not even doing it right. Well, that's because they were actually giving the Olympic salute, but there's a very, like, it, it's a little difficult to tell the difference between the mm-hmm. two. Um, the, the hand is not quite as flat with the Olympic salute, and that's that's about the only difference. So, yeah. It's kind of hard to tell who's giving the Nazi salute and who's giving the Olympic salute. So, like you said, all for the better that it's just not a thing anymore. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) All the nations dipped their flag with the exception of the U.S., the U.K., Switzerland, and the Philippines, which we kind of already talked about with the whole flag dipping thing. Uh, Speaking of flags, no one realized until the Parade of Nations that the two nations of Haiti and Liechtenstein had this exact same flag design, (laughs) which never knew that that was a thing, but... Me neither. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) After this, Liechtenstein added a crown to their flag, and Haiti also made additions to their design to make them distinct. Way to go, guys. (laughs) It's a fun little fact. It is. Yeah, and apparently it was just one of those things, like, they didn't purposely copy each other's flags and no one had noticed until they were both at the Olympics together that, Oh crap, we got these two exact same flags out on the field. How Mm -hmm. how are we going to handle this? Yeah. Leave it to the Olympics to be when you realize (laughs) you have those flags. According to the American writer, Thomas Wolfe, who attended the ceremony, he described it as quote, an almost religious event. The crowd screaming, swaying in unison, and begging for Hitler. There was something scary about it. His cult of personality, which that is eerie to think about. Yeah, yeah, Uh, strong language, uh (laughs) for sure. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Like in Garmesh, the games were officially opened by Chancellor Adolf Hitler, making him the first person to open more than one Olympic Games and the only person to have done it in the same year. Others who have opened more than one Olympic Games are Giovanni Granchi, president of Italy, who opened both the 1956 Winter Games in Cortina, Don Pezzo, and 1960 Summer Games in Rome, Japanese Emperor Hirohito, who opened both 19, or Tokyo 1964 and Sapporo 1972, and Queen Elizabeth II, who opened 1976 Montreal and 2012 London. Yeah, so that's a very small list uh-huh. of, of people. <laughs> and yeah, it's also surprising yeah. to me that Queen Elizabeth II only had two games to her name. I just feel like because she was around for so long, she would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just, but you just assume, but. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, London only hosted once yeah. while she was queen, and yeah. Montreal was kind of a, a freebie, I guess. Um, yeah, like, <laughs> of... like, it makes sense that she only had the two, but I'm like, wow, yeah. even though she reigned for basically forever, um, right. <laughs> it's fascinating that she only got two in there. Not everything went according to Hitler's grand plan, though. U.S. distance runner Louis Zamperini relayed this later on, saying... They released 25,000 pigeons. The sky was clouded with pigeons. The pigeons circled overhead, and then they shot a cannon, and they scared the poop out of the pigeons, and we had (laughs) straw hats, flat straw hats, and you could hear the pitter-patter on our straw hats, but we felt sorry for the women, for they got it in their hair. But, I mean, there were massive droppings, and I say it was so funny. So... (laughs) And... If you've read Louis Zamperini's book, and, and he has the book and the movie Unbroken, which yes. is a biography, but he also has a couple of books that he wrote um, before oh, okay. he passed away. And and he he writes with a little bit of humor when he talks about his life story. So it just, yeah. it makes, yeah, of course he <laughs> thought that this was yeah. funny. I forgot about this story. Um, I, until I've never this heard the story. <laughs> yeah. And I thought it was so funny, just the way he talked about it, like how he just kind of spells it out. Yeah. It, it is really funny to think about. Yes. So, yeah. Again, a plug for the movie Unbroken, the book Unbroken, a um, couple of books that he has of his own. He ran the 5,000 meter race. And mm-hmm. um, though he did not medal, he impressed Hitler with his burst of speed in the last lap. 
And um, I can't remember if you're planning to discuss this later, but just because I'm such a Zamperini fan, Mm -hmm. um, I also think it's pretty comical that one night he went out and stole a Nazi flag that was... (laughs) I didn't know this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure I get this right. Right. So I won't say a ton more, but I think it was, I think it was a Nazi flag that was like flying somewhere in the city, but he like Uh snuck out and did it after his event was over. Um, and like he, I think it was that he lingered around a little bit and he, he could see that things went quickly from being very much about the Olympics to once again, all the bad stuff started to come out in Berlin. Um, and that he could tell something wasn't right. So anyway, yeah, Louis. He he was he was a character, which yeah. makes his story all the more. Um, I don't want to say enjoyable because he went through a lot, but yeah, just you can read about him and feel like you know the guy. Um, yeah. Well, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad his... you brought that up because I <laughs> I actually don't have him in part two. Um, okay. Simply because there were a lot of other people to talk about and. You know, as you've mentioned, the guy already has like a whole book and movie devoted to him. So, uh, so I felt like, oh, let's focus on some other people here uh, who who maybe don't get as much airtime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but yeah, but that's hilarious. I'm I'm glad you shared that. So for now, that does bring us to the end of part one for the 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin. But don't worry, we'll be discussing a lot more about the events and the athletes in part two. But if you enjoyed this episode, and we really hope you did, then we hope you'll take a quick minute to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. But until next time, Odyssey you later. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content features in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.